Hi, everybody. I'm Daniel Keo, librarian here at the Los Gatos Library. Um, I'm joined today with, by Spencer Kleinfelter with the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History um, for this awesome presentation about indigenous land man management along the central coast of California. Um, if you have any questions throughout the program, feel free to put them in the chat um, so that we can see them. If you want to be anonymous for any reason, you're welcome to just message me or Spencer directly. Um, by hitting the drop down under two and choosing the individual that you want to send your message to. Um, we're recording so that we have this later, but uh, if for any reason uh, you don't want to be on the recording, but you still want to ask a question, I'm happy to remove that from the recording later on. So just feel free to let me know that. Um, I also want to just give a thank you to the Friends of the Los Gatos Library. They fund all of our programs uh, here at the library and through their book sales. So if you're in town, feel free to stop by their bookstore any day, Wednesday through Sunday from one to five and look at the books that they have on sale. They're the only bookstore in town. Um, and you can also donate any of your lightly used or new books uh, every Tuesday and Thursday between one and three. Um, again, uh, I'll go ahead and pass this over to Spencer Kleinfelter with the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Hey, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share some slides. So, let's see. So, yeah, my name is Spencer. I do work for the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, and I am our education coordinator. So, my role at the museum is I wear many hats. Uh, we run a lot of programs for K through 12 schools. We run public programs, both virtual like this and in person, uh, whether those are guided walks, workshops, um, virtual and in-person lectures, all sorts of different things. And one of our long-term collaborators and, and partners is uh, the local indigenous tribe in the Santa Cruz region. Um, and so, Collaboratively with them, we've worked to kind of uh, redo some of our programs over the years. Uh, the museum has run a, a really long standing program on indigenous culture uh, focused in the Santa Cruz area. And so, you know, we've entered into conversations with them over the past several years to try to really think more critically about how, what's, what are the things that we're teaching? What are the things that, that they would like to be taught about uh, indigenous presence and history in this area? And that's kind of where my, my knowledge and, and background comes from and thinking about this topic is, is having conversations with that tribe and thinking through the different ways that Indigenous history and Indigenous culture has been learned about um, and ways that we can continue to improve that. So I'll be talking about Indigenous land management along the Central California coast today. Uh, and again, as Daniel said, if you have questions, please feel free to throw them into the chat. I'm happy to pause any at any point in the presentation and answer those. Um, or we can, if you have something you wanna wait till the end and then ask it then, that works too. Or we can always get back to the, the proper slide if it's related to something in particular. So I'll kind of jump in and I wanna start by just centering us really spatially and geographically. And when we think about the central coast here, you know, that phrase can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? So you might say that it starts in Santa Cruz and continues all the way down to Santa Barbara. Um, others would say maybe Monterey is the northern terminus of the central coast, um, right? So it just depends on who you ask, but for the sake of this presentation, you know, I'm gonna be shifting things to include the Bay Area. So all the way up to Marin, the Marin headlands, and then we're gonna you know, trace down the coast through the San Francisco Peninsula, including parts of the East and South Bay down into the Monterey Bay area to the southern end really being the Santa Lucia range, the mountains of, of Big Sur. Um, that's really the context that I'm thinking about when, when I talk about the central coast of California and when I talk about a native culture in, in this particular moment. So I wanna make sure that we're not just thinking coasts though, right? There is some inland um, relevance here. So we're gonna be thinking about the Marina headlands down to Big Sur, but we're gonna move inland as well a little bit and think about aspects of, of Santa Clara County on the north and east side of the Santa Cruz Mountains, as well as the Salinas River Valley on the inland side of the Santa Lucia Range in Monterey County, and then parts of, of San Benito County as well that have 
a lot of open rangeland. Um, and so that's the basic kind of geographic area that's going to be most relevant to the, the content that I'll be covering today. Um, and it's still really, that's a large area. There's a lot going on and we're going to be covering, you know, some of the diversity and variation in this area in the next few slides. Um, and it's really, you know, it's a lot to cover. It's honestly too much to cover in a short presentation such as this, but this is going to be a, a really, you know, high overview of, of some of the management practices done by indigenous people in this spatial area. All right. So to begin to get at that diversity that I kind of alluded to in the previous slide, you know, we're going to start again and go through a series of images here just to kind of, again, get a sense of what does this area consist of? What does it contain? And so here's a photo of the Marin Headlands just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and you can see there's a really interesting mix of vegetation communities. If you've ever been up there yourself, you know that there's these really great stands of redwood trees. And then as you get down closer to the coast, there's these steep slopes of chaparral, there's patches of open grassland. Um, and then as you move south across the opening of the San Francisco Bay, you get into the northern edge of the Santa Cruz Mountains. They rise up in San Mateo County and you get these wonderful old redwood stands um, such as in Big Basin um, and some of the other state parks in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And then, uh, you know, on the western and southern edges of the Santa Cruz Mountains, those slopes trace down into the coastal prairies um, along the, the northern Santa Cruz County coast. Um, and so here you can see an image of Franklin Point, which is part of Año Nuevo State Park. Um, it's this beautiful coastal prairie grassland right on the edge of the ocean at the base of the, the foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, and then you follow the contours of the Monterey Bay, you continue moving south down through Pajaro Valley through parts of the Salinas Valley. You get to you know, Monterey itself, Pacific Grove, Carmel with these really rocky shores. Um, and again, these interesting vegetation communities, some really interesting uh, mosaics of, of plants down there. And then all the way into the Big Sur coast itself with these really rugged, really steep mountain ranges, the Santa Lucia range. Um, and then on the inland side of the Santa Lucia range, there's this really amazing patchwork of oak woodlands. Uh, I have some photos of those I'll show in a little bit. And all of this, again, I'm just trying to set the stage for the biological and ecological diversity that this central coast region that we're talking about contains, right? So marine headlands all the way down to Big Sur, there's so much in between and amongst all of those areas. Um, and there's so many different vegetation types. So these top two photos were taken this past spring. Uh, these are the oak woodlands I just mentioned right on the inland side of the Santa Lucia range in Big Sur. Um, and if you're at all familiar with oak woodlands, you may know that they have these really amazingly diverse um, patches of grasslands amongst them with you know, amazing blooms that you can see here in those photos. Um, actually, all three of these photos here. And then that bottom left photo is just a, a, another image from San Benito County showcasing that open rangeland. Um, and again, the purpose of these first few slides is just to kind of set the, set the stage for what does this area contain? And then we're gonna be thinking about the land management practices that have kind of shaped these landscapes um, to this day in many ways. Um, and the variety of vegetation types that I've been speaking about here really mean a diversity of plant species, um, which are gonna be the source of, of various culturally significant items, right? So all of these different habitats and different ecosystem types um, are going to give rise to different foods, to different basketry materials, to different tool making materials, um, medicines, fiber for clothing, all of the, the necessities and other important items that indigenous cultures on the central coast have utilized for generations. So there's this natural wealth here on the central coast. Um, you know, we've got, again, these abundant oak woodlands that have really amazing acorn productions historically. Um, we've got amazing grasslands. This is a, a, an image of purple needle grass, um, which if you don't know is California state grass, we have one of those. Um, and it, it makes these really nice, lovely looking purple seed heads um, that were gathered in mass in, in the right season as a food source. Um, I'll talk more about this a bit later, but grass seeds are uh, a very important food source for, for many native tribes in the region, um, right? And all of these plants provide not only food, but they might provide fiber, fuel, um, and a lot of other potential uses too. 
Um, and so these, again, this ecological and this biological diversity is gonna provide the context for the cultural diversity that we really have seen um, on the central coast. Um, this image here is hazelnut. And then this last one here is huckleberry. And so again, just showcasing some of the really charismatic plants we have here in the central coast of California. Um, and so again, ecological diversity begets cultural diversity. Um, and I'll circle back to this thought a little bit later, but all of these different landscapes, these different vegetation types um, are going to, to help inform the, the cultural diversity that we're, we're gonna see here in the next slide. So getting into some indigenous history, indigenous presence, uh, we can see this map here was created by uh, Randy Milliken a long time ago. And you can see a label there on the left, it's native people and their languages. And it's basically in line with this area that I'm talking about today. It's shifted a bit north than really what I'm focused on. Um, it extends all the way up to Point Reyes in the Sonoma area up at the top there. And then um, at the bottom of it, it really cuts out just as you start getting into Big Sur. Um, but all of these different words on this map, all of the smaller words represent a tribe um, and the historical area that that tribe has occupied. The larger words are the languages or in some cases, the dialects of that language that were spoken in that area. And so you can see just in this small section of California that there were literally dozens of tribes up and down this part of the coast and, and ranging inland. There's really no area where we see a gap. Um, and if, if you think that there was a gap there, it, there probably wasn't. That probably meant that that tribe just occupied a larger area and, and moved around that area um, throughout the seasons and throughout the year. And of course, if you zoom this map out, you would see that this density of uh, tribes it's pretty universal across California. Um, California itself is, is known to have probably the second highest density of uh, indigenous cultures and languages in the world, second only to uh, a Pacific island. Um, so there's this, this really amazing mosaic of tribes and languages um, that have existed prior to colonization. And I do want to preface that, you know, the tribal, the names we see here, again, represent distinct tribes. Um, but that through processes of colonization, through anthropological uh, studies and research and through just kind of the warping nature of history, right? Many of the tribes here have been kind of subsumed under some other more modern names that I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, and so, right, we see that tribe that just was circled on the map, the Chitoni. Um, it's just one of the many tribes near the Northern Rim of the Monterey Bay. Um, but all of this, these tribes, not every single tribe on this map, but many that you see particularly along the, in the Monterey area, the San Francisco Peninsula, some in the East Bay. Um, a lot of these tribes have been subsumed under a, a different name that most people nowadays refer to them as. And I'm, most of you have probably heard this word before, um, but if Chitoni is the tribe, nowadays they are most often referred to as Ohlone. Um, that's the name that most people learn in school. Um, a third grade is a really big year for learning about native cultures in, in California school systems. And um, many, many, many students, you know, learn about the Ohlone culture. Um, you'll notice, and I'll come back to this in just a few moments, but you'll notice that nowhere on this map is there a tribe with that name. Um, and I'll get it to why that is, but it's, uh, there's, it, it, there's been a little bit of interesting historical shifts in, in how people have referred to the native people in this area. Um, there are some names on this map though that you probably would recognize or do recognize. So up at the top, we've got Napa and Petaluma, uh, modern cities or Napa is both a city and a county. Um, those names come directly from uh, tribes that lived in those areas prior to those cities and counties existing, right? Prior to European colonization. Um, those names were just kind of taken and, and um, used for, for the cities that sprung up in their areas. And then down near next to where I am, I'm coming to you from Santa Cruz, um, there's the city of Aptos. And so there was a tribe there, the Aptos tribe. Um, and so, you know, surprisingly, there are some more words here and there that we don't always recognize um, that come from indigenous languages and come from the names of, of tribes and, and cultures. 
Um, most of the time there's no, we don't use any formal words from indigenous languages, but we do use place names um, like you see here in the, in the names of these towns. Um, and then the last one I wanna focus on here in this map is the Ohon tribe over on the coast um, near present day Pescadero. It was a tribe that, that lived near Pescadero Creek. And this is where the word Ohlone comes from. So there's lots of historical records that talk about settlers first interacting with the Ohlone tribe. And over time, again, just over the decades and over a couple centuries of colonization, um, that name became Ohlone and became the word used. Um, and it was, I believe, initially done just by one or two anthropologists. They started just applying that name to other tribes and other distinct peoples in the region. And over time, that word Ohlone became Ohlone and that became the representative word to describe the huge diversity of, of peoples you see on this map. Um, and so, you know, when we use the term Ohlone, we're not actually referring to a tribe today. Uh, many people might think that that's historically referring to like a, a, a monolithic group, a single entity, but really we're referring to a giant swath of tribes up and down the Monterey Bay, San Francisco Bay area um, that had distinct dialects, that had distinct creation stories, that had distinct cultural practices in a lot of ways. Um, now, it's important to mention that some modern tribes have taken the name Ohlone and they have kind of reclaimed it or claimed it as an identifier. Um, the rooms in Ohlone is a modern tribe that has taken that word um, to, to help self-identify. Other tribes um, don't like the word, particularly because of its associations with colonization um, and the damage that, that colonization has wrought upon native people in California. Um, and so the best practice is always to use the name that uh, the indigenous people are calling themselves. So for example, I mentioned at the beginning that the museum um, has collaborated on, on programming with the Amamutsin. Um, in conversations with them, they've asked to be referred to as the Amamutsin in any programming that we run with them. And so uh, we try to honor that whenever possible. Um, they, not all members of the Amamutsin tribal band um, approve of using the word Ohlone to describe native people here on the Central Coast. It is an important word to understand the context of, and that's why I bring it up here is because in thinking about native people here, um, we, we wanna know, you know where certain words come from and, and what, what their connotations are, particularly for the native people themselves. Um, so that was a lot. This map shows a lot of information. Um, but all of this really is just kind of to say that, you know, there is a lot of biological diversity in the Central Coast. There's a lot of spatial complexity and cultural diversity, as you can see, is really high. Um, and of course, there are distinctions amongst all of these tribes, like I've mentioned, but there are also shared cultural characteristics due to their geographic closeness, um, due to interactions between the tribes historically, we know that trade occurred across vast distances um, and land management practices um, were common across vast distances as well. And so I'll be speaking about general land management strategies. I won't be speaking about any single tribe here on this map, uh, but it's important that we do understand that there are many, many different tribes here. Um, and so, right, culture encompasses beliefs, diet tools, stories, ways of life, um, and I'll be thinking again more generally about the, the shared aspects of land management that the, the different tribes have in this region. So let's get into it. That was a lot of uh, setting the stage and a lot of context for thinking about, well, okay, what is land management by indigenous people on the Central Coast? Um, right, we, we haven't really even gotten to that. So we've got a sense of all this diversity um, but you know, how do these tribes relate to biological diversity? How do native people manage and steward landscapes? Um, and you know, these are some really simple, um, at first glance, these might seem like really simple management strategies that you see here. Um, pruning, coppicing, right? They're, all of these things you're gonna see are gonna revolve around vegetation. That's generally the lens that I'm gonna be coming at um, the rest of the presentation with is thinking about land management practices as they relate to vegetation. And 
that makes a lot of sense. Uh, vegetation right, comprises the base of, of the food web. It underlies most biological processes. Um, and so if you're interested in land management, understanding vegetation and how to manipulate and, and manage it is gonna be key. So pruning and coppicing, the first two on our list, I've got a couple examples here if you don't know the difference. Uh, coppicing is the bottom left, pruning is the one on the right. So the act is somewhat similar, but it depends on kind of how severe um, it's, it's done to the plant. So the coppice, um, it means you basically cut the plant to the ground, almost to, to the soil level, usually slightly higher. So that on the left is what you see. Um, some plants, it's very, very helpful to coppice them. They'll start to grow really long, straight shoots out um, once they're coppiced. And those long, straight shoots are usually what is desired when pruning or coppicing. You want the plant to regrow stems that are going to be really long, really straight, and those are going to be really useful for various things like basketry, for potentially building structures, um, certain tools. So you can see this pruned willow on the right is growing this really long, straight, uh, shoots all the way out from its heavily pruned head up there. Um, that is, is the goal of pruning and coppicing is to grow those long straight shoots. Cutting, somewhat self-explanatory. I'm not gonna be talking too much about burning. Um, I will get into that in the next few slides, but on this slide for a moment, we're gonna, we're gonna hold off on talking too much about burning. Cutting, sounds explanatory. Um, and it might sound similar to pruning or coppicing. The difference is gonna be the plant's reaction to it. Uh, cutting plants is, you're, cutting is done to plants that don't regrow from the same root base. So you can see here in these two examples, this is tule, a really uh, widely used plant that grows in wetlands um, across California and beyond, but particularly in the central coast and a lot of our wetlands and riparian areas. Um, Tule was cut really extensively, it dried out. Um, it turns kind of like a golden brown color. And you can see in the stems on the left, those are tule stems that have been cut that we're looking down into. And you can see that really fine, almost mosaic-like inside um, of, of these thin tubes, um, which act as air pockets when it's cut and dried. Tule becomes really lightweight um, and it becomes really useful to create all sorts of different things. You can create shelters, you can create uh, a bunch of different tools, baskets, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of those in a little bit. Um, and then gathering and harvesting. Um, again, at, at first glance, they sound really simple. Um, and the practice of gathering and harvesting certain plants might in itself be a simple act, but the importance of them over time, over generations when they're done by tribes, um, really can't be overstated. So you can see here is an image of a woman gathering seeds. Uh, she's beating the top of seed heads with a particular tool. Um, the seeds are going into that large basket that she's holding. Um, right, so seeds were gathered, roots were gathered, they were dug up, um, berries and nuts were harvested from different plants. Um, and so all of these practices, again, done over time, done over years and years and generations, potentially centuries, are gonna be really significant in terms of how they affect plant populations and plant compositions and where they're uh, persisting and where they're not. So plants can be gathered, seeds can be gathered and then spread back out in some cases. Um, if, if a plant needs to be eliminated from an area, it can be gathered so much that it just doesn't reproduce. So the scale on which these things are done, particularly temporally, is really important to keep in mind when thinking about indigenous management. Um, and I'll, I'll keep circling back to that point. All right. The last thing I want to say about these practices is just, you know, it's, it, it's not incorrect to say that the composition of species, plant species, um, and animal species in some cases, across California is in large part driven by native management of plants over a huge amount of time. So one I didn't get to in the last slide, which deserves its own few, um, is burning. Um, indigenous burning. Uh, Kat Anderson has said it best, so there's no reason for me to reinvent the wheel. I can just go ahead and quote someone. Kat Anderson is a really prolific scholar. Um, she wrote 
one of the mo the best books I could recommend to anyone on California um, native management practices. But fire was the most significant, effective, efficient, and widespread employed uh, vegetation management tool used by native people in California by far. Um, this image on the left is the Amamutsan tribal band um, engaging in a, a prescribed burn, a cultural burn in the Santa Cruz mountains a few years ago. Um, we know due to historical records, due to um, studies that have looked at fire return intervals, how frequently fires have been in certain areas. We know that in California prior to colonization, um, the amount of acreage that was burned every year was equivalent to or greater than the amount of acreage that burned in 2020, which was in between four and four and a half million acres. Um, and that's in modern history, that's the most acreage that's burned in California by almost double. Um, we know that that's on the low end of, of what was estimated in terms of, of indigenous burning. Other estimates are double that, if not higher. So we know that millions of acres in the past were burned every year. Um, again, it comes down to the scale of things, uh, both the temporal scale, when fires were being set intentionally by native people and what size were those fires getting. We know that there was a lot more spatial complexity to the ways that fires were being set than the fires we see today, the wildfires um, that are reaching 100,000, 500,000 acres. We've now had one fire reach a million acres, one almost reach a million last year, the Dixie fire. Um, fires of that size, at least in most of California, particularly on the coast, um, there's really no record of fires that large occurring prior to colonization. Um, and and then prior to widespread fire suppression that has led to big fires. So um, burning, is, burning is big. Uh, but what, why? So, you know, it might not always come as, uh, it might not be intuitive as to why fire is such a useful process. Um, but California is a really interesting area in terms of fire. Um, a lot of the vegetation communities we have in California are adapted to fire. They persist with fire. Um, and it promotes a lot of naturally occurring ecological processes. Um, and the, this was understood by Native peoples. It is understood by Native peoples in California today. Um, so I'll go through just kind of a few different examples of some of those processes that fire can support um, and goals that can be achieved by using fire in appropriate ways. So. A key one is simply reducing litter, reducing the, the leaves and things, twigs that fall uh, or that accumulate over time um, on the forest floor, in shrublands, in grasslands, if you have thatch, which is the dead grasses that, that die back every year. So it also increases nutrient cycling. Fires typically pump um, phosphorus into the soil. They can also pump other nutrients depending on the vegetation burned. Um, and so you can promote new growth by, at, by burning an area that then pumps some nutrients back into the soil. Um, and of course you can reduce litter so you can open up space on the ground for new plants to germinate and grow. If you have too much fuel accumulation or too much um, litter, too many leaves, too much thatch on the ground, it can be hard for new plants to, to kind of secure themselves in the soil and actually grow. Another really great use of fire and there's excellent documented use of this by native peoples is to help control insects. Um, and pathogen spread. So oftentimes fire can kind of help prevent diseases from spreading amongst certain plant species, um, or it can prevent insect outbreaks in, in certain vegetation types as well, or certain plant species. Um, a really interesting example of insect control and fire in the context of indigenous management is you setting fire uh, in a very in, intentional and carefully controlled way to actually basically herd grasshoppers and other grassland insects into particular areas where they could then be harvested as a food source. Um, and there's documented evidence of that occurring in the Central Coast and other places. Um, insects are a great food source. Insects are highly nutritious and, and were in some cases um, important seasonal foods for native tribes. So fire was a way to kind of gather them into one small area. If you burn in a circle around a big grassland in, all of those insects are gonna end up in the center together in one spot. Um, pretty, pretty clever. Um, 
just kind of going along with that, but thinking of maybe on a slightly larger scale of wildlife management, burning was done in some areas to promote new growth of plants that would then attract herbivores like deer, um, or even just to maintain open patches amongst woodlands and shrublands so that grazing, grazing animals would have an open space to graze on. Um, without fire, grasslands tend to be encroached upon by shrubs, which then eventually can be encroached upon by trees, get shaded out, and all of a sudden you don't have a good understory for, for um, grazing animals. So there's different ways in which fire can be used to kind of promote wildlife presence. And then kind of the big one, and this is the one I think most people are, are kind of intuitively familiar with, is fire can alter forests and vegetation structure. Um, it can help to maintain vegetation or it can shift vegetation depending on the frequency that it's used, depending on the intensity of that fire, so how hot it burns, how severe it is, which means how much vegetation it actually kills. Um, and I'll talk more a bit about this, but all right, you can remove entire stands of trees or you can remove encroaching shrubs in a meadow. Um, you can top kill a bunch of plants in the chaparral system that then will um, sprout new little sprouts or dump a bunch of seed. And all of a sudden you have um, a really good flush of growth next year that might be a, a great source of, of gathering uh, culturally important foods. So that first reason that reducing litter and increasing nutrient cycling, I've got a couple example images. So this is an image that I took and you can see that the fire on the surface is very mellow. Um, hopefully it looks mellow, but it's just burning off the dust, the top layer, the top inch or so of accumulated um, dead material that's fallen from the trees over, overhead. Um, and this low intensity surface fire is gonna again, make space for new plants to find soil to germinate in. It might um, leave a layer of like ash on the soil, which will actually uh, deposit some nutrients into it, particularly with a rain. Um, and it's gonna provide the surviving plants an opportunity to grow with a little bit less competition um, before that flush of new growth that's gonna come in. So surviving plants will benefit by having less around them to compete with. Um, and then new plants will have open spots to germinate in. When, when the time is right, when our rain comes. Um, another, oh, so that, I just mentioned this. Um, and then another just quick image showing an even more um, kind of mellow creeping fire through an understory is this one here. Um, from that same cultural burn that we saw the, the Yamamutsun lighting in that prior slide. Um, and it's just gonna calmly move through the understory. It's gonna maybe burn a couple shrubs. It's gonna mostly burn that top layer of dead leaves and litter um, and make room for, for new growth. So these are the kinds of fires that a lot of indigenous people were setting. Um, less so the like inferno torching fires that, that have been, that make the news um, come August. Um, and a lot of plants genuinely benefit from fire. Um, and this can get a little bit complicated because it's generally true that most individuals don't benefit. By individual, I mean a plant often doesn't like being burned, but as a population of plants or as a species, fire can often be very beneficial for certain species. So uh, this is an example of this oak tree um, burned. You can see the stump right behind those green shoots is burnt um, and could very well be top killed but the roots are not dead. Um, so a lot of plants, even if fire comes through at a high enough intensity to kill them on top, the roots will continue to grow, shoots will pop up. Um, and again, you'll get like a very productive several years of growth following a fire in many vegetation types um, in terms of for oak trees, acorn production can increase. Other plants, they'll just grow really well for a few years um, and then often produce a lot of either material to harvest for things like baskets or produce a lot of um, food depending on the kind of plant it is. Um, and also a lot of plants have these strategies for resprouting and reseeding that native people take advantage of um, and understood that again fire properly applied will encourage these resprouting and reseeding plants to, to really pop for those few years after a burn comes through. Um, and then that last reason I mentioned on the previous slide, 
the, the, the fact that fire can alter forest and vegetation structure. Some of the most interesting historical records on Europeans kind of first coming into parts of California describe it as park-like or garden-like. Um, and they describe these like really open spaces beneath trees, beneath uh, oak woodlands, or even uh, in the Sierra, the coniferous forests and mixed evergreen forests were actually really, really open. Um, the forests we see today, particularly in the Sierra Nevada, um, but even here on the Central Coast, are much more thick um, and, and densely stocked or packed with trees than historically would have been the case. Um, so you can see in this image, right, there's big open spaces between trees. There's not, you can run between the trees in this forest or in this woodland and not run into anything. Um, and that park-like or garden-like structure that was described by some of the early explorers coming into California is in large part thanks to indigenous burning practices that maintained the, that open space um, a lot of the year. Um, fire can also be really useful um, to change vegetation types. So not, it might not just be used to maintain something, but it can be used to shift it. That's called type conversion. And so, for example, increasing the frequency of fires in an area can lead, um, say, a shrubland to convert to a grassland. And again, grasslands being uh, culturally significant for a lot of food plants and a lot of other um, annual forbs, herbaceous plants that grow in grasslands. Um, grasslands are one of the most maintained and, and regularly burned ecosystem types on the Central Coast. And then, Burning, of course, can also encourage habitat for wildlife. So here's an example of a giant oak tree that burned um, and is left behind this kind of standing dead, hollowed out snag. And that might be a really great spot for woodpeckers or bats or some other species to, to find a home in. Um, and there are documented evidence that native peoples could take advantage of that. Um, they might particularly burn certain trees out to attract certain species um, to them. So all of this is to say, right, that fire can be used to accomplish numerous different ecological or cultural goals, depending on how it's used. Um, and there's really no comparison to the modern understanding of how to use fire compared to indigenous uses of fire. Their understanding of when and how to apply it in terms of seasonality, in terms of vegetation type and individual plant responses or wildlife responses to fire, there's there, we don't have a modern comparison to that depth of knowledge that, that Native people have. Um, modern land managers are kind of just starting to get a sense of the usefulness of fire. And we're just barely beginning to figure out kind of how to use it in some cases. Um, so, you know, traditional ecological knowledge, which is a term you might have heard before TEK, uh, is really complex. It's, it's nuanced and it's temporally deep. There's documented evidence on the Central Coast of people being here in inhabited village sites, <clears throat> excuse me, up to 10,000 plus years ago. And given 10,000 years in a place, you can imagine that there's a lot of nuance that you can learn about that place, about how different species survive and persist. Um, again, in contrast to current Western management practices, right? At most, we're maybe a few generations into learning how to, to steward our forests, our grasslands, our shrublands. Um, and realistically, we're in the first generation as we're starting to kind of figure out, okay, maybe some of the ways that we've been managing our, our wildlands and the landscapes around our communities, maybe they aren't working so well, what can be changed? And so we're just finally starting to kind of think about new, um, I say new, but perhaps more accurately, very old ways of, you know, developing a relationship with the landscapes around us. Um, all that to say that we've got a lot of work to do and Native people have gone through this process um, and have a really deep field of knowledge on which to draw from. Um, so 
just to kind of circle back and again, touch on some different reasons for, for different kinds of management. Burning is of course the large one, but um, you can see a couple different culturally important plants here on the left is a plant called bear grass, um, which is considered a fire, fire follower. So it pops up really well in burn scars, the, usually a year or two after a fire. And in fact, it's actually blooming really well in certain parts of the Santa Cruz mountains right now um, after the CZU. So two springs on, there's large patches of bear grass in places that I had never seen it. I didn't know it existed in, in most of the Santa Cruz mountains um, until this spring. Um, and likely the seeds have been lying dormant in many areas, just waiting for a fire to come through. And so that's an example of, right, uh, indigenous management and indigenous people in these tribes would have known where these plants existed, would have known when to apply fire to bring them up. Bear grass in particular grows these really long um, leaves that were used in basketry um, and have these really beautiful flowers. The right side, of course, acorns. We've talked about acorns and oak trees a bit, but um, fire can be used to burn off the first drop of acorns. Generally, the first acorns to drop uh, in late summer, early fall are the ones that are insect damaged or in some other ways um, are, are diseased by, or affected by pathogens. And so by burning in late summer, early fall, um, you can burn off the bad acorns that have dropped and then the ones that subsequently drop onto the bare soil where they'll be easier to collect are gonna be the ones that are actually gonna be used for, as a food source. Um, so again, just a different examples of, you know, the more you know about how species respond to plants and the more you understand their phenology, um, the better you can develop stewardship plans around them. Um, this image is just to kind of reemphasize the idea that burning can help maintain these grasslands. Um, and then this final image is a painting that we have in the museum. Um, it's, it takes up an entire wall in one of our exhibit spaces. It was made by a local artist who, um, again, in, in conversation with, with tribal entities, thought about, okay, what would perhaps a village site have looked like? This isn't based on any one particular location, but it's based on just kind of historical records and, and objects that we have in our collections at the museum about like what might have a village looked like, where would it have been situated, what were like activities um, that might have been going on. And so here you can see, you know, evidence of some of these land management practices that we've been talking about today. Um, Thule is the plant that's covering these shelters, um, or it, that is that boat that's kind of hidden in the reeds there in the, in the water. Um, right, there's all of these baskets that are being used in different ways that have been made from different plants depending on the reason uh, or the purpose of that basket. So, you know, stewardship manifested itself and manifests itself daily in the objects um, and in, in the daily life of, of Native people in California um, in a way that's, that's really a lot different from, you know, how we interact with objects today. And that kind of brings us back to this map. So, you know, really, if you think about the scale of stewardship again, and I, it's hard to emphasize this enough, but the scale of stewardship that exists in native California is smaller in a lot of ways than the scale that we might think of today, right? Um, if we think of entities like the Forest Service and national parks and state parks, they're generally trying to manage very large swaths of land um, and it's really challenging to do that, uh, particularly if there's many different vegetation types and you have very conflicting goals. Um, the, the scale at which management was done was usually at the level of a tribe, perhaps occasionally smaller if there was multiple village sites and um, locations that the tribe was, was living in. Um, but it is very place-based because, again, these tribes existed in these areas that you see on this map for centuries, many, many generations. Um, and again, that relationship that you can develop over that amount of time with that place and with um, the species present there, you can try to, you can eventually manage and figure out, okay, what species are culturally important and which ones do you want to, to design stewardship around? Um, and then, you know, 
a big difference that again modern land managers land managers are starting to get to is the seasonality and kind of adaptive necessity of good stewardship so different seasons necessitate um, different kinds of management and depending on conditions that can change throughout the year right a drought year you're going to manage an area differently than in a wet year um, post burn you're going to manage an area differently than you did prior to the burn so there's all of these different ways that management has to be adaptive um, and seasonal and that's something that i think again looking through historical records and talking to native people there's a, it's pretty quick you can get a sense that that's very there's a very different way of thinking about it than the way that it's done today Something I haven't touched on much because I really tend to focus on the vegetation and the plants is coastal management and utilization of coastal resources. Of course, we're talking about the Central Coast, so many tribes had um, and, and did utilize um, and engage with uh, coastal resources. So uh, shell mounds are something some of you may have heard of in the past. Um, sometimes they're called middens. Uh, but they're basically these giant piles of shells. Um, historically, there's documented evidence. This is a photo of one. You can see that's not just a natural like cliff. That is basically a huge, like hundreds of years worth of accumulated shells and other objects. Basically, the, the leftovers from gathering materials from the ocean or gathering seeds, um, like the shells of seeds, things like that. Um, eventually just accumulated over time near village sites and created these really huge shell mounds. Um, and so we know by looking through these shell mounds what species were often say gathered or harvested by certain tribes um, and that can inform us more about um, maybe how they were managing their coastal resources as well. Right so different species that were potentially culturally significant to tribes when they had access to the coast. Um, this is an object, or sorry, this is an image of objects from our collection. Um, again, just showcasing different kinds of shells that were gathered by tribes um, up and down the coast here. So you can see evidence, right, of abalone and olivella shells, um, other bits as well. So finding these uh, on land in certain areas can inform us, okay, these tribes had access to the coast or they were trading with tribes on the coast. Um, Similarly, we found evidence of, of obsidian in Santa Cruz County. There's no local source of obsidian here, which tells us that trade was occurring across pretty impressive distances um, so that we know obsidian being harvested or, or you know, collected and, and shaped into points somewhere else in California eventually did make its way here even prior to colonization. Um, the image on the right is a fish trap. So a really interesting tool used and made out of willow. Um, these are kind of just some objects from our collections that kind of tell stories about you know, how plants might have been managed individually. So willow, again, that plant that you can prune and to grow really straight, long stems um, that can then be bent and woven together can create objects like this fish trap on the right. Um, and then you've got tule objects as well. So this duck decoy on the left and this boat on the right um, are both made out of, of tule that's been cut and dried and, and woven into certain shapes. Um, again, these like these objects are basically the physical manifestations of, of different kinds of stewardship practices. And so the way I usually try to end every program that I when I'm talking about indigenous presence, indigenous people um, and their practices in California is these people are still here. They're still engaging in these practices. They're in many cases relearning them um, after several centuries of, of colonization and um, cultural erasure. Their, their presence is still very much here. They are still engaged in these practices. They're up and down California. Here again in the Santa Cruz area and active in Santa Clara County as well, uh, the Alamutes and Tribal Band. Um, and they have a, a nonprofit extension, the Alamutes and Land Trust, which is engaging in, in stewardship work of the kind that I've been talking about a little bit today. Um, and so I started earlier, I showed you uh, a 
some text that said ecological diversity begets cultural diversity. And then I want to add again begets ecological diversity because there is this cyclical nature to these two kinds of diversity enhancing one another. And there is this reciprocal relationship between tribes in California engaging with the landscape, getting to know it over a period of centuries, stewarding it, figuring out what works, what doesn't. That enhances the native diversity, the biological diversity. And again, that can then support um, the wealth of tribes that we see um, historically have existed in California. So it's this back and forth that we've seen. That is more or less what I've got to talk about. I did see at least one question in the chat, so I'll open that up in just a moment, but I did wanna leave about 10 minutes, which it looks like I, I did, um, for any questions that people have about any of this. So let me find my chat and we'll chat. Let's see. I'm curious about the role of your organization in advancing these land management techniques? Are you training land managers or providing a forum for tribes and land managers to meet? That's a great question. So the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, our mission is to um, inspire stewardship of the natural world um, by engaging people with nature and science. And so we have been providing in the past, we provided a forum for tribes and teachers to meet. We've, we've provided these professional development workshops where class and teachers um, come to the museum and engage with members of the Amamutsu and Tribal Band. Usually their, their chairman and some other folks come. And they kind of walk the teachers through um, an honest history of the native people in the Santa Cruz area um, and talk about current work that the tribe is engaging in. And then we spend some time with the teachers thinking through how can they integrate these sorts of um, stories and the sorts of narrative that the tribe has with the curriculum um, in their classrooms. So that's something that the museum is, is doing. We haven't run that since 2020, but we are planning on resuming those, those professional development workshops with teachers um, as soon as we can, hopefully, potentially by this fall. Um, the museum itself doesn't provide training to land managers, but we are always looking for ways to partner with land management organizations. Um, we run programs with the high school group where we link them up with other stewardship organizations and we um, are trying to figure out ways to, to get more students engaged with this sort of work. Um, and then of course we run a, a program for K through five classrooms. Um, focused on, on indigenous culture. It's essentially this content, but in a very, in a K through five way. So not nearly as, as nuanced and uh, with the sort of vocabulary I may have been throwing at you. Uh, but we, we are working and we've collaborated with the tribe, like I've said, to make sure that that program is as robust and accurate as possible. Um, and are always in conversation with them as much as we can be to figure out what are ways we can continue to improve how people are learning about indigenous people and, and the Santa Cruz region. If that didn't answer any part of your question, please let me know and I can I can try to answer it. Thank you, Rachel. I'm trying. Um, I do want to maybe mention just I'll mention one resource um, and I can actually maybe share my screen on uh, and bring it, show it to you all. But there's a great resource for folks who might be interested in just learning more about indigenous presence, the modern incarnations of tribes, because they've changed a lot. That map I've shown you with those names, um, the tribes that are active today are going to be going sometimes by the same names you saw on that map, sometimes by different names. Um, and so there's a great resource that I do encourage people to check out which is nativelands.ca. So you can see it here, it's an interactive map. And basically you can zoom in so you can see, you know, this is the Monterey Bay down here. If you were to click on one of these kind of colored polygons, it will show you uh, the local like links to the tribes or other relevant resources um, related to native people in that geographic area. And this actually covers the entire planet, but 
it really is focused on California. Uh, I believe that's where it originally started with. And so you can see I zoom out, there's just tons and tons of these polygons in California. Um, and it's a great resource uh, place to, to start looking if you want to learn more about the tribes that are active where you live or other places that you're interested in. I see things in the chat. Oh, somebody just put there. Yeah, Daniel, thank you. Great, thank you, Daniel. All right. Is there any other questions for Spencer while you have him here? You can also email um, me. I can put my email in the chat. Um, and I'm happy to, to answer questions or if you are looking for other resources, I'm happy to send you those as well. So don't hesitate to reach out if you would like. Yeah, thank you so much, Spencer. This was, um, I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone here learned a lot and uh, it was really helpful really good context for a lot of the land management practices that we're probably hearing about a lot now that um, they're getting a little bit more attention and indigenous communities are getting some land back and some um, opportunities for actually putting these practices back into place. So thank you so much for educating us um, and yeah, providing us with more information and ways that we can follow up and learn more. Sure, happy to. Yeah, and thank you again, Spencer, the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. Um, we're really happy to have you here. We really appreciate being able to partner with you to host these programs. For anyone looking for more programs with them, they host a ton of programs at their own museum um, in Santa Cruz and will be having a journaling program that I should have the date ready on the top of my head. Um, I think it will be the 26th of May. It's a family nature, nature journaling event here at the library. So um, register for that. It's on our calendar of events. Um, and yeah, sign up for our newsletter. Just make sure that you're up to date as we get closer to summer. Um, I'm just putting a link to all of our events. You can just go there and see everything that's coming up later this month. Um, again, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. Great. Right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Have a great night, everyone. Take care.